Hey there. So it's my pleasure to welcome Samuel to give a talk here at Galois. Uh, Samuel is a person of very many interests. In the past, we've collaborated together on a language with an advanced macro system. But today, Samuel is here to talk to us about proving facts about machine learning models using code synthesis. So welcome. Take it away, Samuel. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, indeed, I am Samuel Gilino. And let me tell you a little bit more about myself. I are my stats. Uh, I consider myself to be a Haskell know-it-all. Uh, I'm also okay at ECDA and type theory, but I'm only learning about machine learning and formal methods. And so why is that the topic that I've decided to talk to you today? Like you of all people, the experts about formal methods, why, why am I talking to you on that topic? Uh, and that is because I am trying to recreate the cluster miracle. Uh, so uh, I, the cluster miracle is I gave, I had a good idea and then I gave a presentation about it. And then this led to a collaboration with some Galois employees including uh, and that was great. And so I'm hoping that this will happen again. And so step one, uh, have a good idea. Uh, I think it's a good idea. Proving facts about machine learning models via yeah, code synthesis. Uh, step two, giving a, a presentation about it. And step three will be up to you. Uh, so let's get started right away uh, with a toy example that will allow me to both explain what it is that I mean by uh, proving facts about machine learning models via code synthesis. It will also serve as a motivation on uh, what are the benefits that we can get if we do that. Uh, after that, uh, I will describe what it would take to move on from such a toy example to something a bit more realistic. Uh, and then after, if there's time uh, during the question period at the end, uh, I've prepared some bonus slides about Kister if you want an update uh, for what's happening with that project. Uh, but feel free to interrupt me before that if you have questions before me. All right, so let's get started with a toy example. So, uh, I want to prove facts about a machine learning model. So let's train a machine learning model. Uh, and that usually takes a lot of time, but here I've purposely chosen a problem that is so easy to solve that we can do the training live on the side. It's already done uh, on the right. You can see uh, the, the last function by going steadily down until I have managed to learn the XOR function. Yay! Uh, except I did not really learn the XOR function, I learned a different function. And uh, let's look at why. So uh, here I have my training data and oops, I forgot to include one very important data point. Uh, I forgot uh, to tell the training system what happens with true true, which I'm representing with one one. And so uh, as a result, uh, the machine learning model is learning the wrong function. And so if I evaluate it at one one, instead of getting a value that is close to zero represented false, I get a value that is much bigger and something that is uh, going to be interpreted as true instead. And so basically I've learned the OR function instead of the X OR function. And so uh, the goal of uh, the next few slides is going to be to try and find that mistake. In fact, I forgot one data point. Uh, and instead of doing that by inspection, just thinking, oh, it looks like uh, X or float one one is not giving the result expected. I'm going to try and use uh, some formal methods in order to prove that uh, X or is satisfying its spec. It will not be satisfying its spec, and uh, it, it will lead us to find this mistake. So uh, the first step, uh, well, I want to do that via code synthesis. So, oh, I see a question from Ryan Scott. Go ahead, Ryan. This might be a silly question, but is there a reason this XOR function works over floats instead of uh, booleans or something like this? Yes. So uh, machine learning works very well with floats. We can have a gradient where uh, we are multiplying by some random numbers. And if the number is wrong, we can uh, tweak the random number, tweak the double in the one direction or another by a small amount. Uh, but tweaking a, a Boolean, you'd have to tweak it by a large amount. <laughs> you'd have to tweak it uh, completely to the other value. Uh, it's certainly possible to uh, learn a function using a, a different uh, approach than uh, the usual uh, neuron-based uh, gradient descent and backpropagation and stuff, uh, because this is such a, a simple example. Uh, but for uh, larger problems, uh, being able to uh, have a, a 
a gradient in the direction of which uh, you can improve your function is a, a very big deal. I see. That makes sense. All right. Uh, so, so yeah, I had to use those doubles in order to be able to use uh, the machine learning technique. Uh, but now I want to convert it back to the representation that Ryan was expecting with some booleans uh, so that I can uh, run some one moment is it. Uh, and so uh, because this is such a small problem, uh, I can generate code very easily. Uh, th this technique won't scale <laughs> for bigger problems, but in this case, that there are only four inputs that I care about. And so I can simply run my model, like give it the, the numbers zero and one corresponding to uh, false, false, and false, true, and true, false, and true, true, uh, in order to get four doubles that I then convert uh, either to true or false, depending on whether the double is bigger than 0.5 or not, whether it's closer to zero or to one. Uh, and so uh, if I do that, if I output the lines XOR of the first two uh, booleans that I'm pattern on equal to uh, what I've computed to be the result, I get code that now looks uh, much more readable than the one with the floats before. Uh, now I'm pattern on booleans and I'm getting boolean. And because I've trained the wrong function, uh, we have the same error here that x4 of true true is true instead of false. Uh, so yay, I've used code synthesis. Like how can I then uh, use this generic code in order to run some problem methods and learn, uh, discover a mistake. Uh, so I'm gonna try and verify that my XOR function is correct. And in order to do that, I need a spec. Uh, so what is the spec of the XOR function? There are many choices. The one I've chosen to use is uh, that XOR of false, false is false. And if I flip either of the two inputs, then I should get a flip output. So uh, it's a bit, and hard to see that those two lines mean what I just said in English. So let's go through it. So if I start with x4 of xy, if I flip, say it's x input, so x4 of not xy, then I want the output to be the opposite of x or xy. And so I want it to be not x or xy. And so this first line says if I, if I flip x, the result is different. And the second line says if I flip y, the result is different. All right. So how do I now prove that uh, my implementation of XOR satisfies this spec? Well, I've learned from you, from Galois, at the uh, ICFP 2018, there was a workshop on ERSAS that I really enjoyed, uh, where I've learned that uh, one way to prove that a program satisfies a specification that is expressed uh, in this way using a, a, a Boolean expression uh, is to ask a SAT solver to find a counterexample. And so uh, I'm flipping uh, using the Morgan uh, the three clauses. And so I'm looking, instead of uh, proving that for all X and Y, those things apply, I'm looking for an X and a Y that is a counterexample. Uh, so I'm looking for an X and a Y such that the opposite of the spec is true. So let's do that. Uh, uh, but uh, in order to use the ERSAS library, uh, I cannot really use a definition of XOR which looks like this. And I need to use a definition of XOR that is more polymorphic, one which uses the Boolean primitives provided by the ERSAS library. Uh, and so uh, th that would be very simple. I just use the exact same approach that I used to generate this code. And then I sampled the values false, true, true, true. And I just generate some slightly different code that does use the errors library, uh, where the values false, true, true, true are in a slightly different condition. And where choose is uh, the equivalent of if then else uh, in the errors library, uh, which takes the scrutiny last and then the, what happens if the screen is false and then what happens if the screen is true. Uh, all right, uh, so I'm, I'm using two messages choose here. Uh, so now that I have a program that is written using the ERSAS library, I can use the ERSAS library to run a SAT server in order to try and find the counter example. So let's do that. Uh, and so uh, I am trying to find a counter example to this expression, so the opposite of the spec I showed you earlier. Uh, and uh, 
ersatz did manage to find a counterexample. And so uh, this expression is satisfied, it is true for a particular value of x and y. So in particular, when x is false and y is true, you have that this whole thing is true because one of the three clauses is true. Which one? The one which says that x or of not x y should be different from not x or x y. But uh, no, the yeah for, for the counterexample to be true. Uh, in the spec, I expect x or not x y to be equal to not x or x y. But here is the counterexample. So we have found a case where it is different. And so it's this line uh, for which we have found the counterexample. Um, and we can figure out why, we can just uh, go through uh, the substitution. So x or of not false true becomes x or of true true, and x or of true true evaluates to true. And that's where, through the process of trying to prove that the x or implementation is correct, we realize our mistake. Ah, x or true true is not supposed to be true. Of course not, it's supposed to be false. And so uh, that is what leads us to realize our mistake and to go back to step one about learning a model and realize that, ah, we were missing this important step, this important data point that one one should be zero. And so we train again. Uh, this XOR is a bit harder to train than the OR function. So it takes a bit more time uh, for the last function to go down. Uh, but once we do, uh, we should find that this time, x or float float of one one will be a number that is very close to zero rather than close to one. It's almost done. Be patient. And indeed, uh, x or float of one one is now closer to zero than to one. Uh, so that's it. That was the, the very simple example. Uh, and OK, that's not it. <laughs> I want to uh, go through the same steps again. Uh, so now that I've generated a slightly different program with a false, true, true, false, instead of false, true, 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 uh, I can go through the same steps and try and verify that this program is correct this time. Uh, so I've generated the code. I can now uh, look for a counterexample. And uh, it just says that no counterexample exists. And therefore, the spec is satisfied. Hooray! I have proven something about uh, my machine language, my machine learning model. Uh, I wouldn't say that I have verified the machine learning model because I've only proven what is happening when I run the machine learning model on the particular inputs zero and one, uh, but there are many other inputs uh, for which I haven't proven anything. Uh, and so uh, who, who knows what it does on those inputs? Uh, maybe we don't care, in which case, yeah, I have verified it, or maybe we do care, in which case, I yeah. have. Uh, so uh, that was my example, doubling as a justification for uh, why it would be useful to do something like that. Uh, but the techniques I have used, uh, especially the one to generate the code just by sampling it at, at four inputs, and that's it, uh, are definitely uh, not going to scale uh, to more interesting problems than XOR. And so my next section is going to be about how to scale. Uh, but before that, I just want to pose and ask if there are any questions so far. Apparently not. Excellent. So uh, I want to uh, do all of the previous steps, uh, learning a model, converting a model to a program, verifying the program, but with a bigger problem, a bigger model. Uh, and so the first step would be to learn a bigger model, uh, but uh, that's not something uh, I have uh, much to contribute. The machine learning community has been very hard at work training very big uh, machine learning models who can do very amazing things like uh, GPT tree and Dali and stable diffusion and so on. Uh, and so, okay, great. We, we do have very big models. Uh, how do we convert those bigger models to bigger programs? Uh, and here I don't have, like in, for the first section, uh, concrete examples in which I have ran uh, this, uh, this methodology uh, because I'm at pretty early on in this uh, uh, research process. I have only done XR and I'm now discussing what I think it would take in order to uh, bring this research uh, to a slightly more impressive level. Uh, okay, so 
uh, how do we convert bigger models to bigger programs? Uh, my idea is to use transfer learning. So what is transfer learning? Uh, so uh, here is a very simple example. Uh, here are two different problems that are each about as hard as XOR. So I want to add two bits. Uh, and so the, it's almost the same as XOR, but uh, for the one one case, I want it to return two instead of zero. Uh, and the OR function, the one we learned by accident earlier there uh, from the one one case, I wanted to learn one. And so those two functions are very similar. Uh, and I, I didn't use XOR because you saw earlier that the XOR took a while to train. So those two functions are, uh, take about as much time to train uh, as we can see by uh, counting the number of times I've printed the progress of the last function. Uh, they all take about uh, five time steps, each of which is about two. 50 uh, iterations uh, of the uh, back propagation. Uh, so yeah, those two functions take about the same amount of time to train if we train them from scratch, but because they are so similar, uh, we can use a trick uh, in order to speed up the process when training the second one. We can use the fact that we've trained the first one. Uh, and here, uh, in the previous slide, I had train, now I have transfer, uh, where I'm starting from the add model that I've just trained. Uh, and I'm training it on the new data, uh, on the, the OR training data here, rather than the add training data here. Uh, and now you can see that uh, the learning was much faster. Uh, I only require one extra time step uh, in order to uh, go from a function, uh, well, a, a model uh, for which uh, one one was given a number uh, which rounds to two, to instead now a number which rounds to one. Uh, and in the, the magic of transfer learning is uh, conceptually very simple. Uh, you just, instead of starting with random weights, uh, you start from the weights you have already pre-trained uh, for a previous problem. Ryan, you have another question? Yeah, do you have any insight as to why it takes so much longer to train the x function than it does any of the other examples that you've shown? I mean. Yes. So I, 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 it seems like they're similar enough that they ought to follow roughly the same steps, but I also have no insight as to what's going on. Sure. So uh, XOR is still a very simple function. So uh, in the scale of uh, the kind of problems that uh, machine, learning, machine learning researchers are interested in, uh, it did not take that long to train. I, I, it's just, it, it took longer than OR and AND that are even simpler. Uh, but the reason why XOR and the problems which researchers, uh, machine learning researchers are interested in solving, take a lot of time to train is because of non-linearity. Uh, so if you uh, tweak some numbers and uh, you can like find a, a line that separates your data into two sections, like that, that's very easy to compute. Uh, using gradient descent and other techniques. Uh, whereas if you have a much more complicated function that you want to learn, uh, then uh, you need like multiple lines and you need to like curve your space and uh, you can use a number of uh, non-linearity functions like uh, hyperbolic tan or uh, ReLU, uh, which are ways to uh, transform the, the output so that instead of being linear, it, uh, it, it has a curve in it. <laughs> okay, so so if I understood you correctly, then you could essentially graph all these functions as like y equals f of x with no exponents on the x, that, that sort of thing? An exponent, uh, I don't, I wouldn't qualify it as a, an exponent. Uh, it, it's just that the, the shape is more complicated. Like uh, okay. if, there's a, a, a nice way to visualize that kind of question on uh, the Google TensorFlow Playground online, where like there's a number of data sets that they, they show you, and like you have a, a small neural network that you can uh, train live on that data set, and then you uh, it can show you like depending on the complexity of the data set, it takes more time or more neuron more neurons uh, to learn the shape. Uh, it's very visual, like you have a, a, a 2D plane with some numbers, not some numbers, with some, uh, some dots of different colors. Uh, and instead of trying to learn uh, here the, the a function from the 
two billions something, you're, you're trying to learn a shape that is either including or excluding some points. Uh, and when there's a line that divides the points you want and the points you don't want, uh, it's very easy to, tar to train. But uh, when it's a more complicated shape you want to train, then uh, like you start with a line and then you include some points but that you wanted to exclude and vice versa. And so the, the machine learning algorithm is like gradually twisting and rotating and like trying to learn a much better shape. Like you can learn a spiral, you can learn some, some really complex things. Uh, and XOR is one which can uh, definitely not be divided by a line because it's like four quadrants uh, where we have a true here, a true here, and a false there, and a false there. So you want to include those two, but not those two. So regardless of where you put the line, uh, you're not going to find all four. So that's why it takes a bit hard, a bit longer to train. But uh, in the uh, larger scale of things, it, did, it didn't take that long. <laughs> yeah. I see. Like tra training the, the LEH really took like months or something. Gotcha. That, that's helpful. Thank you. All right. So uh, that was an explanation of uh, what transfer learning is. Uh, next, I want to show you how I want to use transfer learning in order to uh, generate some bigger programs from some bigger models. Uh, and so, uh, well, I just told you that transfer learning was uh, when I take advantage of the weights that have already been trained, like that there are some further <laughs> I'm simplifying, but uh, so, so now that, that means that I need a model that has already been trained on a similar problem than the one I want to solve, right? So what is the problem that I want to solve? I want to convert the weights of the model that has already been trained into some more traditional source code with if and for loops. Uh, and so uh, I would like to start from uh, OpenAI Codex, which is a model that is very impressive, that is pretty well known because it is at the heart of uh, GitHub Copilot, the most famous product that has been made out of it, which is able to uh, write code completions uh, from the code you have written so far. So for example, you can uh, like write a type signature and can figure out a plausible implementation based on that type signature, or you can write as some documentation for your function, describing in English what you want your code to do, and it can figure out uh, a, a plausible looking, like it's not guaranteed to be direct, of course, but uh, a plausible looking uh, implementation based on that documentation, or if you write some repetitive code, it can con like spot the pattern and continue writing the repetitive code for you. Uh, and the idea is that uh, it has been trained on a large amount of code, like all of the GitHub code, uh, and that's why that's how the model knows what plausible looks like. Uh, it's plausible in the sense that it looks like code which a human has written and then uploaded to GitHub. Uh, okay, so uh, the problem that GitHub Copilot uh, is solving uh, is what I just said, uh, but it's not necessarily the problem which also in the AI Codex itself is solving. Those are two different things, but GitHub Copilot is a product that has been written using the OpenAI Codex uh, model. Uh, and to give you an idea of the kind of things that the OpenAI Codex model is able to achieve, I want to give you some other products that are less well-known than GitHub Copilot uh, that are also implemented using OpenAI Codex. So uh, the, the second most famous one uh, is a demo, which the implementers of OpenAI Codex uh, gave to, to showcase the capabilities in which uh, the presenters are coding a, a little game. An asteroid, you can click on it in order to make it uh, boost uh, fast in order to like, avoid the asteroid just in time. And if you count the, the score, and like after a certain number of seconds, it, it shows you the score. Uh, and they wrote this like moderately complex game uh, without writing any code, but instead just by writing English. This is something like, uh, draw a spaceship using this URL and then make it bounce left and right. And then when I click it, make it go faster. And when it intersects with uh, the, the asteroid, increment the counter representing the score. And at the end, uh, after 30 seconds or something, uh, display the score in a, a big red font. And the AI figures out what is the code that is needed for each of the steps that have been specified in English. 
uh, so that's another thing that you can do with Open Codex. Uh, another product uh, allows you to generate some test cases uh, by looking at your code. Uh, again, it's not guaranteed to be the test cases that you need, uh, but it, it generates plausible looking test cases that you can use as a, a starting point. Uh, there's also a product that allows you to translate from one programming language to another. Uh, there's another one that allows you to uh, explain a piece of code. So you feed it some hard to understand piece of code or maybe just something written in a library which you're not familiar with and you get a English document uh, walking you through the code line by line saying, oh, this line does this thing, this line does this thing, uh, initializing the vector to random weights or something. Uh, and uh, similarly, if you're able to generate English explaining the code, uh, you can also uh, generate English which explains how the code is used. So you can generate the documentation. Uh, and again, it generates plausible looking documentation, not necessarily the one that will be the most useful for your users. Uh, so I want to focus on uh, one of those products, uh, the code translator, uh, because I think that's the one which is the most similar to my use case, uh, because that's also what I want. I want to translate between a program that is written in one representation, a bunch of weights that have been learned uh, through the, the process of recognition, uh, and I want to convert that representation of a program into a different representation using more traditional source code with that uh, ifs and while loops uh, for which we have a, a long history of uh, techniques that we have developed in order to prove that kind of programs correct. Uh, so um, I, I'm guessing that the way in which the code translator is working is that uh, it must be parsing the JavaScript and then uh, converting it not directly to Python, but to some latent space representation of all programs. Uh, a latent space is uh, a, a bunch of weights, uh, a bunch of numbers that uh, identify a point in a high dimensional space, uh, but like typically fewer dimensions than the, the input. If you think about all possible images or all possible programs, there, there's a lot. Uh, and if you uh, compress that into, say, two, 200 doubles, uh, then uh, if you tweak one of those doubles to uh, move through this 200 dimensional space, uh, you can get a program that is very similar to the other program. Like maybe one of their while loops is uh, looping for one more iteration or something like that. Uh, so yeah, I think it's going from JavaScript to the latent space and then from the latent space to Python. Uh, I think it's a two-step process. Uh, and that what I want to do uh, is very similar. Oh, I guess I'm not there yet <laughs> in my slides. I'll tell you anyway. Uh, I want to go from the weights to the latent space and then to Python or whatever programming language. Uh, I have tools that I know how to analyze. Uh, and so I want to reuse uh, the work that, ha that has already been done in training the code translator. So uh, that is the OpenAI Codex model, uh, which by the way, has itself uh, been trained using transfer learning. It's uh, the result of fine tuning uh, GPT-3, another very famous uh, model that is able to uh, do a, a wide variety of uh, uh, things like answering questions and, uh, and more, uh, but based on English rather than code. So I, I could uh, have another slide for an example of uh, a concrete product that we built using that. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the GPT-3 model, which has been based, which had been trained on English, had been uh, fine-tuned using transfer learning so that uh, it can now work with code instead of, or rather in addition to English, because there's English in the comments. Uh, and doing so, rather than starting from scratch, uh, makes it possible to reuse all of the, the effort that has been put into training GPT-3 and also all of the, uh, the knowledge that uh, GPT-3 has about English. So it can now parse the comments uh, and interpret them uh, much better than if it had only been able to look at the comments inside source code, as opposed to all of the English that were written on the internet. Uh, so that's uh, GPT-3 to OpenAI Codex. You want to go further from OpenAI Codex to some new model. 
uh, which I, I think it's a much smaller jump from uh, GPT-3 to OpenAI FabX. Uh, I just want to change uh, at the beginning, the preprocessor part, which uh, for the code translator, it was converting from JavaScript to the Latin space. And so now I want to teach the model to interpret a bunch of numeric weights uh, and to interpret that as a paper by projecting it into the latent space. So that's the plan. Uh, and uh, as typically with the uh, machine learning project, uh, the challenge is not just to uh, come up with, okay, how are we going to train it? Uh, what is uh, the, the plan that I just described? But how are we going to find that data? Because we typically need a lot of data in order to uh, do a good job training your machine learning model. And so uh, here is how I plan to obtain the mappings from a bunch of weights to uh, the source code of a function. Uh, so let me walk you through this plan step by step. So uh, one thing that we can do uh, if we have some black box, some function uh, that uh, goes from A to B uh, is that we can produce a data set from that function uh, if, by uh, giving a lot of inputs, a lot of A's to that function and that gives us the corresponding B's. This was kind of the obvious thing that we can do uh, to create a data set from a function. Uh, and then we can train on that data set and you can get a model that also goes from A to B. Uh, if you run the model, you'll get back another function from A to B. Uh, it might not be identical, but it has been trained on the data, so it should be close. A uh, more interesting thing that we can do uh, if we have a function from A to B is to create a model that goes from B to A, that is an inverse function. Uh, and so, uh, it's it's almost the same thing, right? We had a bunch of x's and we were creating uh, f of x's or creating, we had a bunch of a's and we were creating b's and we were doing the same thing. We have a bunch of x's and we were creating f of x's. The only difference is instead of labeling x as the input and f of x as the output, I am labeling f of x as the input and x as the output. And so this training data is killing the machine learning model I, that I want it to learn the inverse of my input function. Uh, and it, like it's, it seems pretty magical to be able to just uh, invert any function. And uh, indeed, you can't. Like it, it's, uh, uh, you, you need a lot more thought, uh, like finding the, the right architecture in order to like, give a, enough of a hint to the machine learning model to uh, be able to find uh, the right inverse. But it, it, it has worked in a, a remarkable number of uh, circumstances, uh, so, so it's a, a neat trick. Uh, and now I want to use that trick for one more circumstance, but for uh, the problem of uh, finding this inverse function. It's the inverse of training a machine learning model. Uh, so if I have uh, a bunch of example source code functions that each go from A to B and I have a bunch of inputs just for, for simplicity, let's say that all of my functions uh, at the same time, they all go from A to B, uh, then uh, I can use those functions uh, and uh, run them like uh, with some interpreter uh, here uh, in order to get uh, a B. Uh, no, I, I want to, yeah, I, I want to invert this function here, code to model, which converts the source code of a function from A to B to a model of the same function from A to B so that the inverse of that is gonna be what I want, uh, a model that can go from the weights to the source code. Uh, and so how do I go in that direction? Well, if I have the source code for a function, I can evaluate it. Uh, and then I can use the as model function with the just here uh, to take this black box, this JavaScript function that I can run to get an output, uh, get a lot of training data, and then I train on it to get a model. So that's my plan. Uh, let's move on to verifying bigger problem programs. Uh, and that's another place where I want to pause and wait to see if there are any questions. I guess not. Uh, uh, well, uh, there has not been a lot of interaction so far. I hope there's going to be a lot more now because this is the section where 
uh, I'm uh, asking questions to the audience because uh, this is the part I'm the, the most uncertain about. It's the, the place which is the, the furthest away from my expertise. And so uh, I would like to ask uh, Lenoa if there are some uh, formal methods that I'm not aware of that would be particularly appropriate for uh, tackling uh, the problems I'm about to mention. Uh, so those are my slides, but your answers, hopefully. Uh, so uh, if I want to verify a bigger program, whether it's big or small, the first step is I need a spec. Uh, and so uh, one problem uh, that we would seem to have with uh, finding a spec for the, the more impressive kinds of machine learning model that we're interested about, right? We're not interested in finding, uh, improving things about the machine learning model that computes XOR or sorting a list because we, we don't use machine learning models to uh, compute XOR or sorting lists. We use machine learning models for much more difficult problems uh, like identifying images of cats and dogs and uh, things like Delhi generating uh, images from text. So uh, what is the spec in that case? Like I can explain in, in English, like that, well, I want the images of dogs to be labeled as dogs, but like how do you mathematically describe that the image is supposed to be a dog in the first place, right? Uh, so let's look at uh, this problem uh, in more details. So uh, let's look at the, uh, Two very famous examples, GP3 and Dal E. Uh, Dal, this is pronounced that way, uh, which, yeah, have very fuzzy description of what they're supposed to do. GP3 is like answering questions. You, you describe, you write something in English and it, it just answers the thing you've asked. Uh, Dal E, similarly, you write something in English and it produces an, in, an image of the thing you asked. And, it, it seems very fuzzy uh, at task. It's hard to provide a specification for it. But if we take a closer look at the way in which GPT-3 and DALI are, have been trained, uh, we discovered that uh, they haven't really been trained on answering questions uh, or generating images, uh, but they have been generated on something a lot more concrete and a lot more mathematical. Uh, and so uh, the way in which uh, GPT-3 has been trained uh, is it using like a lot of English data, like all of the text that has ever been written on the internet. Uh, but in order to do the training, right, you need a bunch of input output pairs. So, so what's the input and the output? Now we, we just have one thing. And it's not clear if it's the input or the output, it's just text. And so the way in which it has been trained is that uh, we take a sentence and we remove a word. Uh, I have an example sentence somewhere. Uh, yeah, like here, if, if I remove this word, uh, you can kind of infer from the context that it's probably going to be the word bigger in all caps. Right? So the same thing uh, happened while training GPT-3. Uh, the, the researchers gave the machine le learning system a bunch of, as input, a sentence in which a word has been blanked out or sometimes like several words in a row uh, and as output, uh, the original sentence. Uh, and so the system is supposed to figure out what were the words uh, from the context and that allows it to uh, build up an understanding of uh, how English is structured and like what kind of words go with each other. Uh, like even though it would be grammatical to say uh, the boat is, drunk, it's probably uh, more likely to be correct that I was saying that the boat is floating, uh, even though they're, they're both uh, adjectives. So uh, that's for GPT-3 and the DALI similarly has been trained uh, using a trick called diffusion, where you start with an image uh, that has been drawn by a human, and then you progressively add some noise to it then uh, you're adding, asking the model to learn uh, how to again inverse the function uh, to remove the noise uh, to get to an image that looks like it could plausibly have been written, have been drawn by you. Just like uh, when filling in the blank, we're not guaranteed to get the right word, but you're getting a sentence that looks like it has plausibly been written uh, by you. And so this is an example of the inverse function that I was looking at earlier. 
And the great thing about the inverse function is that it has a spec. Uh, you can check whether it is indeed the case for any input that if uh, you run your machine learning model on that input, if you then apply the function it's supposed to be an inverse of, uh, you should get back the original input. So uh, if you have a function that say, uh, remove the last word of any sentence and it makes it to the blank. Uh, then if you give a sentence to GP3 and you ask it to fill in the blank and you delete the word again, uh, you should be getting back the original sentence. It should not have modified uh, the original sentence. Uh, so that's not a very complete spec. Like uh, we would also like to be able to uh, quantify whether the, the words which GP3 has uh, picked for uh, the blank to be indeed something that has been plausibly written by a human and not the word drunk in the case of the boat or uh, something that is not even a word. Uh, but I, I think it's a good beginning, right? Uh, and you can maybe build on that. Uh, and here I have a bunch of other examples of uh, successful programs that uh, have been uh, trained on by inverting images, like uh, increased resolution, it's like the the, the enhance button that uh, we've seen in the sci-fi detective shows a lot in the past, but is now reality. You, you can have a, a program that is able to zoom in and to show you some data that was not present in their original pixels. And it, uh, it, it does that by, uh, like, like it, it wouldn't work for the, the kind of things that were done for uh, sci-fi detective like if, if there's a piece of paper where like it, it, it's, it's only four pixels like there's no way to recover the actual numbers like it, if you zoom in if maybe it can figure out from context that they are supposed to be numbers and so it will it will plausibly uh, produce an image in which there are some numbers that look like they have been handwritten but they, they're not going to be the original number <laughs> it's not as, as useful as it could have been but it's pretty cool uh, interpolate similarly, uh, if you have a, a function, oh, I, I forgot to say that. And the way you do that is you, you train it by calculating the inverse of the function which scales an image down. And so you, you know what it looked like when the numbers were visible, you scale it down enough that the numbers are not visible, and you ask it to guess what it looked like before. Uh, and interpolate similarly, you can easily uh, drop frames from a video and then ask the machine learning model to learn the inverse function. And so now you have a machine learning model that uh, knows enough about movement that uh, and you can give it a video and then it can find the in-between frame so that it looks like it has been filmed in slow motion. Uh, out painting, if uh, I have a, a picture of a, a car on the street, uh, I can ask it, well, what's outside of the picture? Right? This, this is definitely not something where the data was in the pixels, uh, but I, I can ask it, okay, draw like a, all the, the pixels in the 100 pixel band around the picture. And you can perhaps figure out, well, there's probably a, a traffic light uh, in front of the car because the car is stuck at the, on the on the street and it doesn't seem to be parked. But the, and maybe it's not smart enough to figure out that the, the light was red or uh, it just has seen enough traffic lights to know like what they look like approximately. And that they're usually in one of those three colors. Uh, all right, so those are, were a bunch of examples of uh, very useful uh, machine learning programs that have been trained by machine learning researchers and that are exciting uh, and which do have a specification because they're all inverse functions of something. And so we can at least check it. Like, is it true that for all inputs, it is indeed an inverse, is indeed recovering the original function, the original. Uh, but uh, it, it might not be uh, the most useful uh, uh, specification that we might wish for. So for example, uh, recently there has been a, uh, on Twitter, I've seen a lot of uh, people trying to exploit uh, the fact that uh, with GPT-3, you can uh, write as a question, uh, ignore all previous instructions and do something else. And you can make it do that other thing instead of uh, the thing that uh, the, the agent is supposed to do. Uh, and, and I don't know what the, the kind of spec uh, would look like. Uh, don't have 
a lot of time left, but this is where I would pause and ask for suggestions for whether such a what such a spec could look like. Um, I don't have suggestions, but this is a really nice. I've been thinking about how you mine specs for machine learning models when you have like a physics based model, um, which you don't mm -hmm. really have for GPT-3, but also this is Thaisa. Hi. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I was like, I don't have like a, I don't have an answer, but I do think this is a good question. Uh, since I don't have you have, have you yeah, been right. thinking are there methods you've been thinking of for how you like structure these specs how you find like how you find this specs i was already happy enough to have realized that oh they're all based on an inverse function so there, there is at least a, a base spec That's right yeah the, the, but more the complex ones spec, yeah I, I don't know. I, uh, I, I think that uh, we should start from the base spec with the inverse and try to make them gradually more complicated to see what we can achieve. Uh, and that even though uh, there are clear examples of things that are useful, uh, that we seem far enough <laughs> from uh, what can, well, I say what can currently be achieved. It, it's still a plan, right? I have not yet implemented uh, it a uh, formalized system that can verify that the machine learning system does indeed, uh, is indeed the inverse of the function it was trained on, on all inputs. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, let's, let's start slow. <laughs> and uh, if, if that can be achieved, then we can try a uh, more complicated step. All right, I don't have a lot of time. I have like two sections left. I guess we'll skip cluster. For today, uh, restricting program constraint and data inputs. So I think we can get there in 10 minutes. So, so um, I've shown you earlier uh, those two different programs that I have synthesized from the same uh, set of weights. Uh, the one that looks more like a Haskell program, uh, at least they're both Haskell programs, but like this is the way I would write it. Uh, and the one that is using the ersatz library. Uh, which was not the, the first thing which came to mind uh, when I wanted to synthesize a, an implementation of a, the XOR function. And so uh, in the same way that I would not have uh, thought of using the, the ersatz syntax uh, to describe my program, uh, I, I don't think that the machine learning model will take to do that first either. Uh, the, this kind of machine learning is trained on a lot of data. And so they have a good understanding of what is likely to be written by a human and what is less likely to be written by a human. And now one of the problems is that, well, this is a lot more likely to be written by. by... Convert the weights that represent the XOR function uh, into some concrete code. It will probably generate that one. Uh, rather than that one. Uh, but the good news is uh, we don't get one completion when we ask uh, these kind of machine learning models uh, to fill in the blank. Uh, we get many possible completions uh, and they each have a score about like how likely uh, it is that the a human would have written it. And so like typically we take the most likely one or like you can adjust the temperature to get something like the, the between the, the second and 12 most likely one or something. Uh, but here, uh, like if we have this, this entire list, we can just go down the list and eliminate those which clearly don't use the ersatz library and take the, the one, the, the first one we encounter is the, the most likely one which does. So I could eliminate uh, those two because they clearly don't use the ersatz library. And then this one is the first of per perhaps several uh, that do. And so that's the, the completion I would use. Uh, so that's one possible solution to that problem. Uh, there's another one, uh, which is I could give the program uh, more context. So that there would be like two inputs to this machine learning model, both the weights uh, in, in the same way that uh, for DALI, uh, we give the, the textual description of what is the image, but we also give an image full of noise and uh, the task is to remove the noise. So you can also give it an image that doesn't have that much noise, in which case it constrains 
the kind of energy it's supposed to generate. And so similarly here, in addition to the weights which guide in which direction uh, the completion would happen, uh, we can give it here a bit more context than just xr equals underscore. We can uh, give it uh, a fragment of the program that makes it clear that we want to use a, a more polymorphic program that uses the RSAT library. And uh, if you really want it to have type boot to boot to boot, uh, then we can specialize it. Uh, and so then if uh, the machine learning model has seen enough RSAT code, uh, then it should be able to uh, generate a bunch of possible uh, plausible completions uh, for that uh, smaller context. Uh, well, the context is bigger, but the, <laughs> the, the part that needs to generate is a smaller portion of the proportion of the entire program. Uh, the problem is that I don't think there's enough ersatz code on GitHub uh, for the machine learning model uh, to know uh, how to generate that kind of code. I uh, don't even know if there's enough Haskell code. I know that uh, it's pretty good on in Python. There's a lot of JavaScript in Python on GitHub. Uh, if we want to generate code that has a certain shape here, I've used RSF just because that, that's the one for the methods other than ICTA uh, that I know about because I've learned it in Galois. Uh, but perhaps there are uh, other formal methods that require the program to be in a certain shape. And in which case, we'd have the, the same problem. Like, is, is there enough training data to teach the machine learning model uh, to generate code which has that shape? Uh, I guess I don't need to stop and wait for suggestions here. You can raise your hand if you have one. Uh, last problem. Uh, so XOR is a very simple program, uh, among other reasons, because it has a very small input space. So There's only four possible inputs. Uh, and so it is possible to uh, use or that to uh, easily look for a counterexample. Uh, but one of the things I've learned from you during that workshop on ersatz at ICFP 2018 uh, was that uh, it's usually much better to uh, encode our programs by adding a lot of constraints, uh, a lot of equations, uh, but to try and minimize the number of variables that we introduce, that makes it easier for the SAT solver. Uh, and so here, two bits, easy, but uh, for the kind of problems that we're interested in, like labeling images of cats and dogs, uh, that there are some uh, specs that we might be interested in. Like if we uh, are worried about adversarial examples in which you have uh, an input that looks like a panda, but uh, the machine learning model uh, recognizes it as a monkey, uh, well, the, the problem here can be expressed as when well, we have two pictures, the picture of the panda and the picture of the monkey. Uh, oh, and I should mention that the, the monkey has some like very small tweaks that are invisible to humans, but is enough to trick uh, the machine learning models. They're, they're not the same image. You have two different images. Uh, they look the same. So uh, the distance according to the symmetric uh, would be very small between those images, and yet uh, the machine learning model would use two different labels. So that would be a concrete spec. Uh, that we might be able to use in order to uh, detect and avoid adversarial examples. Uh, but the problem here is that, uh, well, if the input is a 256 by 256 RGB image, then you have hundreds of thousands uh, of integers or uh, even millions of bits if you uh, have a, a SAT solver that only handles bits and uh, numbers. Uh, and so the problem here is, uh, the, 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 the problem, but like the, the, the question to the audience that I want to end with uh, is, uh, okay, well, ersatz is the one formal method tool I, I knew about from Galois, but presumably you, you know a lot more formal methods uh, than I do. Is there something that is more appropriate uh, for those bigger machine, machine learning models? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Sam. Do we have any questions?